welcome to History and Mops. Even you, Terry. Even you. Thanks for coming out on this uh, comparatively nice uh, April evening to uh, enjoy a, another history talk and perhaps something to eat and drink. Uh, this is ending our fourth season of doing this, so I'm beginning the planning for uh, next year, starting in September. I'll tell you about what uh, the May topic is. We have one more for this season uh, afterwards, after we're done. There's uh, a clipboard back there with a place to put your name and email address on it if you want a personal invitation from either me or somebody at the museum on Monday afternoon, we'll send you the press release so that uh, in case something happens with the Daily A, like happened today, uh, you'll be able to see what uh, tonight's talk's all about. It's all right. <laughs> the uh, uh, museum puts us on, uh, co-sponsor with uh, uh, Seaside Brewing here, every last Thursday of the month, uh, September through May. So like I said, the next one will be the last one for the summer season, and then we'll start up again in September. There's information on your tables about the museum. There's a number of people here that are either from the museum or are members already. Uh, take a membership form and fill it out and give us some money if you'd like. But uh, also you can take the rack cards and give them to your friends, tell them about the museum. We are undergoing uh, renovation finally after about 20 years of being uh, pretty well stable. Uh, we're getting ready to involve ourselves and, and immerse ourselves in the uh, area here a lot more thoroughly than we've done in the past. And we want to be a, a wayfinder for people that are either residents like most of you or visitors like some that just happened to hear about this at the museum today and uh, came on over, yeah. We'll be able to help you find those places in Seaside and around the area all the way from Cannon Beach up to uh, the uh, Columbia River mouth in Astoria. And uh, one of those places that we'll be sure to point out is Fort Clatsop National Historic Park. And I don't know if you're aware, there's actually more than one site where that's located. One of them happens to be about uh, 10 blocks south of here. The uh, Salt Cairn is actually part of the Fort Clatsop National Historic Park. And it's kind of interesting, you go down there and there's a sign that says uh, this is part of the park. It actually says fee area on it. So every time you go by there, walk by, make sure you send a check up to the port so that you can say you visited. Uh, I've, I've asked uh, a number of people about that, why that says fee area. You know, there, there's no place for it. It's actually free, so. Um, <clears throat> we have a lot of plans for the future, so please, if you want to know anything about what we're doing, you're going to hear about it anyway. But, uh, come and talk to us, uh, somebody with the museum. We're really excited about what we're doing, and we would, even more than your money, we would really like your time and help to help us figure out what to do, and uh, just give us you know, an hour or two a month, and we greatly appreciate it. So without further ado, let's get to what you're here for. Uh, the women of the Lewis and Clark Expedition, I heard this uh, uh, Sally talk about it uh, last October, when the Lewis and Clark, uh, there we go, yeah, Trail Heritage Foundation was here for their 50th anniversary meeting in Astoria. And there was one day where all they did was go out to Fort Clatsop and uh, learn, and, and there were various speakers. One of them was Sally. And I've known Sally for all of the five years I've been here. She is uh, actually my boss. Uh, I'm a volunteer on the trails, at least occasionally. Um, and she's the one I work through. She's a volunteer coordinator, and uh, she knows how to shoot the guns. Uh, yeah, watch out for it, right? Uh, she does a lot of things up there, and you have a Lewis and Clark question, all you have to do is ask Sally, and you'll get the right answer. But tonight, she's going to talk about something that you don't hear a lot about, 
and uh, I know you're waiting for her to talk and me to stop, so here's Sally for you. Thank you, Steve. We'll make sure we're not tripping our staff here. Um, I wasn't sure if flintlocks were allowed in the building, so I didn't bring one today. Oh. Um, but maybe I should have. We'll see. So hopefully we won't all trip over each other. I'm really impressed with this building. Let's see, before we get started, I want to do one last pass through if anyone wants a copy of the map to help us keep our bearings. I'm going to pick them up and just hand any more through here. So the one side of that is a map of the Lewis and Clark National Historic Trail. Um, if you were catching news, I lose track of time. About a month ago, there was a huge lands package that went through Congress and was signed by the President. And one of many things it did was it expanded what they now call the Eastern Legacy of the Lewis and Clark Trail. So the trail now includes all the parts that on that brochure were hoped for are now part of the Lewis and Clark National Trail, also including Monticello and um, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. and the Ohio River. So, uh, so the trail's much longer now. Okay, so as you know, the Lewis and Clark expedition involves an amazing young woman. She's now quite famous, and it's easy to think she was the only woman involved in the success of the Corps of Discovery. But if we research further, we're going to find out there were a lot of women who were important in this chapter of American history, and what we're going to do for the next little bit is find some examples. So I'm going to back up a little bit to So there aren't images of very many of the women we're going to be referring to, but there are um, images of a few and guesses at some. This woman lived into just about the age, the age of early photography, and we do have, I'm not sure if it's a woodcut or a photo of her, as an elderly woman. And a recent artist has taken that um, image of Lucy Marks and kind of backdated it. What might she have looked like as a young woman? And to people who like the Lewis and Clark expedition, who is Lucy Marks? She's the mother of Meriwether Lewis. Very good. And we're so to talk about Lucy Marks, I did bring a prop to make me think about her and it's a glass jar that has some ginger root in it. Lucy Marks was an herbalist and a skilled herbalist. And so we know Lewis later in life is a skilled botanist. We think we know where that came from. 
She also was an excellent cook. And there's several times on the expedition where Lewis is traveling by foot as they're traveling on the Missouri, moving the boats upstream, and he actually gets to what's going to be their camp ahead of the rest of the expedition and starts cooking dinner for them. We know where that comes from. Also, according to some research, she was very skilled in the use of firearms. Her husband was an officer in the Army during the American Revolution and actually uh, passed away during that time. And uh, so Lewis lost his dad when he was, I think, four years old. And Lucy Marks uh, marries a friend of his, and that's where, where Lewis gets his, uh, or th that's where, where she gets her last name of Marks. She was uh, Lucy Merriweather. Uh, Merriweather is a family name. I read something recently, it was on the internet, it must be true. And uh, it was one of those obvious, but maybe it's true, that says the name Merriweather literally translates to happy no matter the weather. <laughs> Never even thought of that before. So Lucy gave up that last name and marries, I think it's John Marks. And and lives a long, full life, and just because of how she raised her son, she contributes to this expedition. And of course, all of the men of the expedition had parents that contributed to who they became. So she's just one example. The next one I want to mention is we think about these expedition members all being single. Most of them were, but not all of them. They were trying to recruit men who were single, and encouraging them to you know, not be worried about family back home. But John Shields had a wife back home, and he had a daughter back home. And I don't know much about them, but we do know their names. His wife was Nancy, and his daughter was Jeanette. Now, they kind of broke the rule in recruiting Private John Shields to join this expedition because he was a blacksmith and they needed that skill, and maybe he and Nancy had a long conversation about, you know, well, okay, you can go, but you better come back, and you are never doing this again. <laughs> who, who knows? But, um, but it did work. There's at least one other man on the expedition who has a wife. I would say back home, okay, back in the United States, and that is William Clark's enslaved man, York. York has a wife but owned by somebody else. So we don't know if they ever really got to share a home or not. And we don't know, we do know that they did get to spend some time together after the expedition, but it sounds like they ended up being separated just because of slavery and the way that slavery worked then. But York does have somebody back home and he sends a gift to her after, uh, during their winter in Fort Mandian. Um, all the stuff that they inventory and send back home, I believe it's a, a bison hide that is uh, going home for York's wife. There was a lot of work in preparing for this trip. A lot of supplies had to be put together, a lot of things had to be made. Uh, Jefferson and, and Lewis spent a lot of time planning the details. They worked with army contractors, and one army contractor they worked with sewed 93 of the shirts that Lewis purchased for the expedition members in 1803. Her name was Matilda Chapman. So Matilda Chapman contributed to this expedition. Now if you actually found the actual news release information, you might have seen this picture. This is somebody that's pretty famous in history but you might not have known that she contributed to this expedition. Anyone know who this is? Dolly Madison. Very good. So James Madison and Thomas Jefferson were, had been good friends for years and, and involved in lots of things together and had mansions in Arbor Mount County and Orange County and not too far apart from each other and their families knew each other and such. And as you remember, when Thomas Jefferson was president, he was widowed, so there was no first lady. So Dolly Madison sort of took on some of the first lady duties. Um, when the Lewis and Clark expedition was here at Fort Clatsop and celebrating Christmas as best they could, I read in a children's book one time what was going on at the White House is Dolly Madison had teamed up with Thomas Jefferson and they had put on a Christmas party for the children of Washington, D.C. 
So they've been partnering up a lot. A lot of these um, planning sessions that Jefferson and Lewis held in the White House, uh, James and Dolly Madison were there, and so she was aware of what was going on. So she and the other wives of Jefferson's cabinet members were captivated by the grand daring quest into the unexplored wilderness. They were also concerned for the welfare of the expeditionary force. And when Jefferson found that his congressional appropriation for the expedition fell short of funding the voyage, Dolly and her friends stepped in to fill the gap and did everything possible to raise funds for the journey. Dolly focused her attention on equipping Meriwether Lewis, whom she knew well from their many meetings at the President's house, and his close friend William Clark. And the expeditionaries, quote, were fitted up with camp equipage and everything thought to be suitable for them. She was present when the intrepid explorers were entertained prior to their departure and often worried about their safety. Almost four years later, Lewis, and Clark showed their appreciation by bringing back souvenirs and curiosities for the ladies. And Dolly even received some of their silver cooking utensils that they had used during the journey. I brought a silver candlestick, it's not really silver, I don't think, um, to remind us of Dolly Madison. In later years, she remembered the captains clearly and often spoke of them fondly. So the expedition finally starts to get underway. If you're going to follow along on the map, you might want to find Pittsburgh on the Ohio River. And the first full day of travel, there's a horrible accident. How many people have heard of Mayor with the Lewis's air rifle? Have you heard that Lewis had an air rifle? Well, there's an episode that is barely mentioned in Lewis's journal probably because it was kind of embarrassing and it happened on the first day of the trip. And if you read what he wrote in his journal, it sounds like they pulled over on this island called Bruno's Island. Somebody on the island has asked him to demonstrate the air rifle, and he does. And as he's, he's fired it, he hands it to a man named Blaze Sinus who I don't know much about, but apparently he's quite prominent in politics at the time. And Blaise Sinus is not familiar with how it works. It goes off in his hand and hits a woman at 40 paces, grazes her temple, she falls to the ground, blood spurting, she's passed out. This is not a good way to start your expedition. <laughs> There's a man who is a um, descendant of um, the Bruno, who owned Bruno's Island. His name is William Bruno, and he's now retired in California, and he decided to do some research about the expedition's hour or whatever they spent on Bruno's Island. And he's come up with an interesting theory that the way we read it in the journals isn't what happened. He was trying to figure out who were the boatmen that Lewis has recruited for this first part of the journey and he came upon an interesting character. And he might be right. Ever heard of Mike Fink? <laughs> According to William Bruno's research, Mike Fink came close to being a soldier on this expedition. Mike Fink was a very good boatman, a very good shot, would not have been a good soldier, apparently. <laughs> Didn't take orders, liked excessive drinking, and he would go into um, army camps and army bases and challenge the soldiers there to shooting competitions. And some of the officers would let this happen because it was a good challenge for their soldiers. Um, if you, you know, can't shoot better than this drunk boatman, um, maybe you need to practice a little more. Well, Lewis needed boatmen, and Mike Fink had a lot of skill, and so there is a chance that he spent a few days on the expedition before Lewis fired him. Well, Mike Fink had a stunt that he pulled many, many times over the years involving many, many different people. And he often would convince a woman, sometimes his girlfriend of the month, to hold a shot glass of whiskey on her head at 40 paces out. 
and he would shoot it off, and apparently he usually succeeded. Well, the, the girlfriend at this time is someone named Pittsburgh Blue. So William Bruneau's research ends up turning around Lewis's journal entry. Maybe Mike Fink and Pittsburgh Blue are traveling on the keel boat. They get just out of town, they're on Bruno's Island. Mike Fink, who loves firearms, is like, so Lewis, can we try out the air rifle? And Lewis pulls it out, demonstrates it, and then Mike's, oh, I've got this great stunt. We have to do this great stunt. And Pittsburgh Blue has a cup of whiskey on her head and they pace off 40 paces. Somehow talk Blaze Cenas, who's probably never used this gun, into trying this. He doesn't realize that an air rifle has a little bit less pressure in the air chamber with each shot. So the bullet's going to drop a little sooner with each shot. Fortunately, he's a little off-center, so instead of it dropping a little bit in the center, it drops a little bit in the side. She recovers, and they leave quickly, and he seems to fire at least one of his boatmen fairly soon after that. Why would we say the expedition starts further east than Pittsburgh? Because of like what we're saying right now, Lewis has to get the boat there. He has to collect soldiers there. Um, if you talk to someone from um, Louisville, Kentucky, they will tell you the expedition starts there because that's where it becomes the Lewis and Clark expedition. That's where Clark literally steps on the boat. So um, they've added this eastern legacy of the trail um, to account for the fact that these guys didn't live in St. Louis, they didn't just get all their equipment in St. Louis to start their trip, that there is this eastern legacy that includes kind of before the um, May 1804 and after the Septem <coughs> September 23rd, 1806 time, so um, kind of convenient. <laughs> so we're getting closer to actually being on this expedition, and we are going to be in the St. Louis area next. Uh, just across from across the Mississippi from St. Louis at Camp Dubois. Um, as you know, the Louisiana Purchase was coincidentally happening, and so the Missouri River drainage, the western drainage of the Mississippi, is just becoming American land as this trip is getting underway. And a lot of historians think that they intentionally camped on the side of the river that has been American for a while so nobody would question that they were there. It also was private land, and the landowner actually gave them permission to camp there. And while they're there, it's a pretty big crew of people, probably, I'm not sure, 40-some at that point, and they have uh, their camp set up, five little cabins, and, and they start, some of the men have been in the Army a long time, some are Kentucky frontiersmen, they are just joining the Army as they join the expedition, and they're, they're getting themselves organized, and we learn that they have a little bit of help. Starting in, I think it's 1801, there was one position that the U.S. Army could pay a woman to do. One kind of work she was allowed to do. Laundry. And a typical laundry woman might be, um, you might have a camp that had, say, 100 soldiers, you might have four laundry women. Well, this expedition, maybe 45 men camped at Camp Dubois, has one laundry woman. We don't know a lot about her, but we know they refer to her as Mrs. Kane. So January 6, 1804, two of the men, William Werner and John Potts, um, they're in this expedition and they got in trouble for fighting. Well, our smart captains have a good punishment for them. They need to build a hut for Mrs. Kane to live in while she stays at Camp Dubois. These men are gonna have to learn to work together on this expedition. You're gonna have to work together to build quarters for Mrs. Kane. February 5th, Clark's journal says, Mr. Kane sent us some buttermilk. So maybe Mr. and Mrs. Kane have a farm nearby. We don't know a lot of details, just these little blips out of Clark's journal. Buttermilk, that wouldn't be too bad if you're out in the 
at Camp Dubois. And April 15th, 1804, we're getting close to the expedition starting, and maybe Mrs. Kane has farm duties starting up because apparently she's done now. And Clark, quote, settled with Mrs. Kane for all to this day. So they have paid her for all the laundry that she's performed. Every once in a while you wonder if um, the expedition a few months or a year or so into the trip, every once in a while one of the soldiers might have turned to another soldier and said, I really wish we had Mrs. Kane to do our laundry. <laughs> So they start their expedition traveling up the Missouri River, and um, they end up encountering uh, the Teton Sioux. And that, they knew that was going to be a challenge. The Teton Sioux sort of owned that section of the Missouri River, and they would let river boats go up and down the river if they paid them enough. And the expedition had bales of gifts that they were going to give each Indian nation they encountered. They had to kind of guess how much they would need. They didn't know who lived in the West. They, they knew some of what they would encounter up into North Dakota. After that, it was going to be unknown. So they, they've got gifts that they're planning to give to the Teton. And as they meet with these Sioux people, this is September 27, 1804, they realize that there's some people there who don't really fit in. And now, um, if you read William Clark's journal, he, he's from Virginia originally, and he adds extra R's. And so, um, if I use the word squaw, I'm going to use it in context as uh, a quote. Um, it's actually not a good word to use. It's a very negative word, um, so we'll only use it in quotes. But, um, but since there's an extra R, William Clark actually says squares. So, 25 squares and boys were taken 13 days in a bat. 13 days ago in a battle with the Omahas. So they realized some of the people they're seeing are captive. And now Pierre Cruzat, one of the boatmen, his mom, another character who is helping our expedition, we never meet her, but Pierre Cruzat is bilingual. He speaks French because his dad was French, and he speaks Omaha because his mom was Omaha and he's been working for the army for a while, so he speaks English. Well, because he speaks Omaha, he goes over and has a conversation with these prisoners, and these women and boys tell him that the Teton Sioux are planning to stop the expedition, which was good information for them to know. They kind of had their guard up already, now they know it's true, and they literally have their guard up the whole time they're there, and they're able to eventually kind of muscle their way through and continue upriver. They get up to North Dakota in October of 1804, and that's as far as they plan to go. That's kind of where their maps stopped. Um, they had maps that Nicholas King had put together of what was known in the American West. One of the things that amazes me about this time in history is the biggest terra incognito, the biggest blank on the map of the globe at this point in history was the American West. Africa had been better mapped than the American West, which just boggles my mind. So they, they're going to be stepping into the blank next spring. But right now, they're in North Dakota, and winter comes early in North Dakota, and they've made it to um, today's Knife River Indian villages, or the Hadatsa, um, and uh, Mandan villages, and they settle in for their winter. They build their campsite, Fort Mandan, and right off they meet um, a couple who are sort of famous in Lewis and Clark lore. Who, who is it that they meet that's living there already? Sacagawea and Charbonneau. Very good. So Tucson Charbonneau and brings over his two or three wives and asks if he can be a part of the, um, the winter. He speaks French and Hidatsa. He's from Canada, and he's been trading with these people for a while. He has uh, at least two wives, maybe three, um, that are Snake or Shoshone Indians. At least one of them is going to be famous and uh, about to give birth and speaks the Shoshone language, and the rest is history. Um, you've probably heard of her. You've probably seen statues of her. You've probably used um, U.S. coins. Um, that have her and Jean-Baptiste on them, so we won't spend much more time talking about this remarkable person, um, but she's going to join them during that winter. Now, there's some other women there that are very helpful to the expedition. 
Part of why the explorers wanted to get to the Mandan villages during the winter uh, to, to camp there is because they knew that the Mandan women were farmers. Well, that's a darn good idea to camp near people who might have a few extra vegetables sitting around during the winter. And so they're able to buy you know, um, pumpkins and squash and roots and, and lots of things to get them through the winter from the Mandan people. And the farming was done by the women. Um, another historian sent me a note one time and he said that um, that the expedition was kept alive during that brutal winter by the garden foods that the women provided. I don't know why when women farm we call it gardening, <laughs> but we do. Um, but he also wanted me to know, he said, I, I assume you know the lodges were built and owned by the women, and upon divorce the husband's few belongings were placed outside. <laughs> In North Dakota. <laughs> And this is where John Shields is going to be helpful. John Shields is a blacksmith. The explorers had a forge. They, they brought it this far on the journey. They, they didn't bring it across the Rocky Mountains, but they did have it set up during their winter at Fort Mandan. And farmers have tools. Tools might need sharpening. And so the expedition sent up kind of a, a sharpening tool repair um, facility and sent the word out to everybody that we would love to have your tools be in the best shape ever in exchange for a few vegetables. And it worked. And the, the baskets of vegetables were arriving and the tools were all sharp and ready to go. But North Dakota winters are long. And all the tools are fixed. So what do you do now? Well, the expedition invented a, a knife that they could make out of some simple metal that they had and, and they started cranking these knives out and selling them and in kind of a curiosity um, months later they run into somebody who has one of the knives that John Shields made back in North Dakota and the knife has gone west ahead of them. <laughs> kind of interesting. So the Mandan farmers were very helpful. The Mandan people told them, um, there's big mountains out west, so your idea of boating across North America might be limited, and um, you're going to need to get horses to carry your supplies. And the people who live on the east side of the mountains are the Shoshone. And you're going to want to watch for Shoshone people as you continue up the Missouri River. And so they do that, and, and pretty soon they get to where they they eventually are seeing these mountains in the distance and starting to wonder how they're going to get through. This is the only, well, one of the few times on the trip that they're traveling for a long distance without seeing any other human beings. And historians and, and scholars figure other human beings saw them, but they are not seeing anybody. And the rivers are getting smaller. They get to Three Forks, Montana, where the Jefferson Madison Gallatin, which this expedition names, they come together and they form the Missouri River and they decide to continue up the Jefferson River. It seems to be coming more west, more out of the mountains. And now the Jefferson River is getting smaller. They've got um, their red pirogue and their white pirogue, long, narrow, kind of rowboat shaped um, dugout boats. And they have six dugout canoes that they made during that winter in North Dakota. And it's getting hard to move these boats upstream because there's not a lot of water. The rivers are getting small. And two rivers come together to form the Jefferson and they continue up the Beaverhead. And, you know, Sacago Bay is kind of famous for, you know, guiding the explorers out west. And we're like, that's not what she did. But she did point out Beaverhead Rock and said, we're getting really close to where my people should be this time of year which was very encouraging for these soldiers tired of dragging these boats upstream. And Lewis is, plans several little expeditions where he starts scouting by land and he wants to meet Shoshone people so they can um, buy horses and hire guides to get through these mountains that seem to be getting closer every day. And he um, asked Sakagawea, when I meet 
and of course this has to be through translation. He speaks English, and so uh, you find one of the soldiers, like Francois Labiche, who speaks English and French, and, and you know, can you translate this message? And then he gives, uh, Labiche gives the French message to, to San Charbonneau, and Charbonneau uh, gives the uh, Hidatsa message to Sacagawea, and then it comes all the way back up to Lewis. And so the basic question was, can you think of any way I can communicate when I meet your people um, that I have friendly intentions? And she tells him two things. Uh, part of what he seems to be asking is, how do I tell them that I'm a white man? Like, that would be important for them to know. And, and how do I tell them my peaceful intentions? So, so what, would, what would you call a white man? And so she teaches him a word or a phrase, something like tababone or tababone. And so he, he learns it, he memorizes it. And she also teaches him that um, a vermilion, a red a paint on your face is a sign of peace. And he remembers these things. And he heads out with some of, uh, a small group of the soldiers while Clark is back with the boats, trying to drag these boats upstream. And they have several close encounters where they just miss running into Indians. They scare them and they run off. And then on August 13th, they have just missed uh, encountering this one group and they have the encounter that actually works out better. And I'm going to let Lewis tell the story. We had not continued our route more than a mile when we were so fortunate as to meet with three female savages. The short and steep ravines which we passed concealed us from each other until we arrived within 30 paces. A young woman immediately took to flight. An elderly woman and a girl of about 12 years old remained. I instantly laid by my gun, set his gun down, and advanced towards them. They appeared much alarmed, but saw that we were too near for them to escape by flight. They therefore seated themselves on the ground, holding down their heads as if reconciled to die, which they no doubt expected would be their fate. I took the elderly woman by the hand and raised her up, repeated the word tababone, tababone, and stripped up my shirt sleeve to show her my skin. To prove to her the truth of the assertion that I was a white man, for my face and hands, which had been constantly exposed to the sun, were quite as dark as their own. They appeared instantly reconciled. And we find out later from scholars, tababone would not really translate necessarily to white man, it actually would be a little closer to stranger. <laughs> Oops. They appeared instantly reconciled, and the men, his soldiers, and, and George Juilliard, coming up, I gave these women some beads, a few moccasin awls, some pewter looking glasses, and a little paint. I directed Juilliard to request the old woman to recall the young woman who had run off to some distance by this time, fearing she might alarm the camp before we approached and might so exasperate the natives that they would perhaps attack us without inquiring who we were. The old woman did as she was requested, and the fugitive, fugitive soon returned almost out of breath. I bestowed an equivalent portion of trinket on her with the others. I now painted their tawny cheeks with some vermilion, which with this nation is emblematic of peace. After they had become composed, I informed them by signs, probably through George Juilliard, who knew the sign language, that I wished them to conduct us to their camp, that we were anxious to become acquainted with the chiefs and warriors of their nation. They readily obeyed, and we set out, still pursuing the road down the river. We had marched about two miles when we met a party of about 60 warriors mounted on excellent horses. Yep. Well, the explorers have been looking for people with horses. <laughs> who came in nearly full speed. When they arrived, I advanced toward them with the flag, leaving my gun with the party about 50 paces behind me. 
The chief and two others who were a little in advance of the main body spoke to the women, and they informed them who we were, and exultingly showed the presents which we had given them. These men then advanced and embraced me very affectionately in their way, which is by putting their left arm over your right shoulder, clasping your back while they apply their left cheek to yours and frequently vociferate the word ahie, ahie, that is, I am much pleased, I am much rejoiced. Both parties now advanced and we were all caressed and besmeared with their grease and paint till I was heartily tired of the national hug. <laughs> but they might not have had a national hug without the, the work that they did to get these women kind of on their side and Sacagawea helping in the background. So um, just trivia, um, who was the chief Kamiawait to Sacagawea? Her brother, their brother and sister, which, well, I guess you ran into the right band of Shoshones, didn't you? That worked out pretty well. So they spend some time with the Shoshone getting ready to go through the mountains, trading for horses and, and hiring guides. They end up hiring a, a man named Toby and his son. August 20th, we find Shoshone women are making and mending moccasins for the group. Well, that's pretty handy. I brought a moccasin here. And when the explorers were at Fort Class, they've been making over 300 pair of moccasins. You wonder if they said, yeah. sure, it would have been nice if some of the Shoshone women were here making moccasins for us. Four days later, um, the expedition is moving from where they called Camp Fortunate, which is where they met this band, to uh, a different Shoshone camp, which is going to be kind of their base camp for getting ready to go through the mountains. And they have purchased about 20 horses and a mule, and they load all their baggage that they've been carrying in boats all the way up the Missouri River, and they, they get it all on these horses, but there's leftover baggage. And in the journals on August 24th, if you look at each journal writer, all of them except one say something about the women carry the remainder. So I'm reading that and I'm going, oh, hey, they're, they're just the importers. They're, they're carrying the stuff. Well, Sergeant John Ordway clarifies how the women are carrying it. And he says, then the squaws took on their horses the remainder of our baggage. Okay. Um, Two days later, as they're actually on this trek between the two camps, Lewis writes about a fascinating short story. Well, short for him. One of the women who had been assisting in the transportation of the baggage halted at a little run about a mile behind us and set on the two pack horses which she had been conducting by one of her female friends. I inquired of Camille Waite, the chief, the cause of her detention and was informed by him in an unconcerned manner that she had halted to bring forth a child and would soon overtake us. In about an hour, the woman arrived with her newborn babe and passed us on her way to the camp, apparently as well as she ever was. Wow. Then he writes his whole essay on, on, um, on childbirth and American Indians. Well, the explorers finally make it through the Bitterroot Range of the Rocky Mountains, which is kind of like our coast range. It's tree-covered ridges, except it sort of keeps going a lot longer. It's not the Rocky Mountains that you see in the posters with the glaciers and things. It's, it's tree-covered ridge after tree-covered ridge after tree-covered ridge. And Toby guides them through till they get to westward flowing water. And on the banks of the Clearwater River, they find some pine trees and make five dugout canoes and continue their trip by water. But they're going to meet another important woman before they build those canoes. If you read about the journals, you know going through the mountains was, or the journey, um, was hard, and they're hungry. The hunting's not going well. It's September, and a lot of the game animals are not there. And this is one of the hardest times on the trip, and they're miserable, and they're slogging through snow next to their pack horses, and when they finally come down, they meet which nation of Indians? 
very good, Nez Perce. And there's a woman living among the Nez Perce who has an amazing story. Her name is Watt Kubis, and her story is recorded in a book um, that we sell in the bookstore um, called Do Them No Harm. And we don't know all the details of her story, but when she was a, a youngster, maybe a teenager, she was a victim of a raid, and she was kidnapped by uh, Blackfeet Indians, and uh, made, made to do drudgery, and abused, and had a horrible, horrible life. And probably traded away from person to person, and somehow she ended up being traded further and further east. And at some point in her life, she ended up living next to a big water. And historians wonder if it's Hudson Bay, or if it's one of the Great Lakes. And by the time she's living there, she has somehow encountered a white man who now becomes her husband. And she's living in a white community. And she makes friends with uh, a woman who's white. And these people are all very nice to her. She wants to get back home, but she, she realizes, you know, these people are nice. This might be an okay place. Um, she and the father end up having a baby boy, and life is better than it had been. And then one day, her friend tells her, did you know that your husband and some of the other men are planning a journey, and they're going to go across the really big water, and you're going with them? Well, now she's not so sure about this. She loves her husband. These people have been nice to her, but her dream has been to come back home and be with her people, the Nimipu, the Nez Perce, in future Idaho. So she's very scared. What, what would she go? Maybe, maybe her husband's going to leave her, and she's going to be here, or maybe he's going to take her across the big water. She doesn't know. And her friend provides her with a hatchet, and Wakuis decides to escape and start traveling west. And the story of her traveling reminds you of like underground railroad stories. She didn't know who was safe and who wasn't safe, so she's traveling at night, and she's trying to hide from people during the day. And she gets further and further west. And then there's an episode where the baby boy gets very sick. And she doesn't have enough food either and the baby does not recover, and he dies. And now she's out in the middle of nowhere by herself, almost wishing she could die, mourning her son, and realizing, well, maybe the legacy will be that I get back home. So she continues traveling west, and does the best she can, but literally runs out of food, runs out of water, runs out of energy, and is collapsed and dying. That she, before she passes away, two hunter trapper, um, I think I'm trying to remember what nation, Indian nation men, come upon her, and they find her in serious trouble, and they nurse her back to health, and they help her on her next leg of her journey, getting back to her people, and she makes it, and Watkuis translates to something like she who who was away and has come home. And she was in the right place at the right time when the core of discovery comes straggling out of the mountains and into Nimipu home country to finding a village where the men are watching these soldiers coming out of the mountains and having an open debate. What should we do? Should we be good hosts? Or should we take all those guns? and take over. So Wakuis is probably chronologically a young woman when the expedition come into her community in 1805, but her body has been through so much. Her body's actually elderly. And she's in um, kind of like a teepee, uh, living with um, relatives, and she hears the voices outside, people talking about strangers arriving, and she asks people to, to lift the, the flap of the teepee 
so she can see these strangers arriving. And when she gets a good look at them, she props herself up on her bed and says something about, well, those are white men, like the men who were nice to me. Do them no harm. And the, the news goes through the community like wildfire. Wakui says, we need to be nice to these people. The core of Discovery come into that community and meet the nicest people. <laughs> William Clark mentions that he meets a woman who has traveled to the east and has met white people. We don't know if he knows any more about the story than that. As the expedition makes their boats and continues on, the oral tradition among the Nimipu is that, oh, and, and historians wonder if Sakagawea and Wakui's got to have a conversation. They've had some similar life experiences. Maybe they did. But Wakui's really was on her deathbed. And as soon as the expedition started their trip continuing west, she passed away. But she contributed to this story. I'm probably not going to pronounce this woman's name correctly. She's Cayuse. Pitoya or Pitalia, it's spelled P-E hyphen T-O-W hyphen Y-A. She remembered, she, she's about 110 in this picture, which I think is impressive. Um, she lives until 1902, and uh, she passed away at the age of about 111 years old. As a child, I, I did the math, she would be about 14 when the Corps of Discovery traveled through. And so she, and of course a lot of people in the West, got to meet the explorers. And she just outlives the other witnesses. And years later she was able to describe that she met Clark, she met Lewis, she met York. And when um, Eva Emery Dye was traveling in the West and doing research for a book on Sakagawea, called The Conquest. She interviewed Pitoya, and then that news got out, and Olin Wheeler, who was a historian working for um, the railroad company, he was uh, writing what ended up becoming a really good series of books on the explorer's route and where they traveled and what you'll find there today, and he got to interview Pitoya. So we continue our trip November 2nd, we're getting into our part of the Northwest, and uh, we're getting near where um, Cascade Locks and the Cascades and the Dalles and that area is. And uh, November 2nd, Clark writes, About the time we were setting out, two squares came over loaded with dried fish and bear grass neatly bundled up. Soon after, four Indian men came down over the rapid in a large canoe. The next day, Clark wrote, we set out and proceeded on very well, accompanied by our Indian friends. So we're getting into the part of the journey where they don't have one guide. They have um, maybe a local man and his family will kind of take them to the next town and then hand them off to somebody else who takes them to the next town. Near the Sandy River, Clark, on November 3rd, next day, um, he writes about a canoe arriving from the village below the last rapid with a man whose wife have wife and three children, and the woman who had been taken prisoner from the Snake Indians. I sent the interpreter's wife, who is a Sosoni, or Snake Indian of the Missouri, to speak to this square. They could not understand each other sufficiently to converse. So they tried. They were hoping they had enough Shoshone language in common that um, they could have learned more about the land. But he does mention that this family and the Indians we met from below continued with us. The explorers finally arrived in Pacific County, Washington, and they set up a camp at Middle Village Station Camp across the river, and um, that's as far as they're going to travel by boat along downstream on the Columbia, and uh, Lewis does a trip with uh, Juilliard and Reuben and Joseph Field and goes into Cape Disappointment area and up as far as Long Beach, Washington, then comes back into the camp. And then Clark announces that the next day he's going to do a similar trip. And anybody who wants to join, just be ready to go in the morning. 
you know, about half of the expedition does. They, they've seen the ocean at a distance, but they haven't walked on the beach yet. Maybe there's going to be a European trade ship. Maybe you can you know, resupply some trade goods or something. So they're getting ready to go on this trip, and they're on foot now. And um, they get to the mouth of the Chinook River. And they're on foot, and there's a river. And it's November. There's no bridge. But there's some Chinook women in canoes who notice the predicament. And uh, Clark writes, um, this creek, here we were all set across in one canoe, big canoes, by two squares. To each I gave a small fish hook. They decide that they can't find a really good winter headquarters in future Pacific County, Washington. And they decide to look in future Clatsop County, Oregon and end up uh, finding the Fort Clatsop campsite and setting up their winter camp, building Fort Clatsop, celebrating Christmas. Right after Christmas, they um, send some men to set up a salt making camp. You may have heard of this. And uh, they end up operating that camp for about seven weeks. I did bro I brought brochures about the salt works. Um, the salt works, by the way, it was identified by another Indian woman, um, sometimes called Jenny Michelle, who remembered um, that at least one of her parents um, had seen the expedition making salt at that site. So they get the camp set up and Willard and Weiser, who had helped with the setting up the camp, they come back and report to the captains at Fort Clatsop how it's going. They bring back a sample of salt and what else do they bring back? Whale blubber. Because a whale has beached just the other side of Tillamaquette. This is a great view from up here. Well, the explorers have been eating a lot of poor elk meat. Poor as opposed to rich, full of calories, full of fat. This is the healthier version of the elk meat because they're too late in the season as they're um, hunting now in, in December and January and the elk are living off their fat reserves. So whale blubber would be quite a treat. So Clark, um, this time he doesn't just announce I'm gonna go the next day. Instead, he does a little bit of planning and, and apparently assigns some expedition members. Be ready tomorrow morning. We're gonna um, go in quest of this whale. He apparently does not invite the Charbonneau family. And Sacagawea has not actually been to the ocean, not actually been to the beach. And she finds out about this and says she thinks this is very unfair, that she should not be allowed to go. And William Clark realizes his oversight and corrects it. And so Sacagawea and Toussaint Charbonneau and Jean-Baptiste, who's almost a year old now, um, are now assigned to this party. So early in January, they. They leave the, the fort probably by canoe going down what we now call the Lewis and Clark River into Young's Bay, up the Skippinon with some little portages ending up out on Clatsop Plains and uh, spending the night somewhere um, between uh, there and, and Gearhart and getting up the next morning, checking in at the salt makers camp and then, um, you know, where is it that the whale is beached and everybody's like, you know, it's over, over there and they hire a man to take them to it, pay him with a file, and they get to the mouth of a creek that they name. What name is it? Ecola. You guys are good. Ecola, which um, William Clark says is the Chinook word for whale, because there's a whale up there right now. And they check in, and they've noticed lots of traffic, lots of people walking over to Little Kid, doing the same thing they're doing, going down to get um, blubber and meat, and remember Clark was going in quest of the whale. He's probably a little disappointed. He gets there and he finds a really big skeleton. <laughs> well, he's been measuring things all the way across North America, mouths of rivers and different things with the surveyor chains. And in the journals, he tells us how long this whale skeleton is. So we think he measured it. He writes it was 105 feet long. If Clark is right, and the skeleton is 105 feet long and it's intact, that would mean the animal would extend a little bit beyond that in both directions. What kind of whale would that have to be? Yeah, assuming that 
we have the same whale species around then that we know of now, it would have to be a blue whale, which is remarkable. And people were buying the blubber, they were buying um, the meat. The meat has mostly been sold, apparently. And they're, um, the Clatsop and Kilimox people, or today's Nahalem, are have set up a camp right there. I don't know if there was already a town or not, and they are, are harvesting off of this and selling it to the people coming in. And the expedition by um, uh, Clark works at a deal. He's got about 15 people in his party and they buy um, 300 pounds of blubber and several gallons of oil. It's a big whale. And Clark's still disappointed, he wanted the whole thing. And the whale is on the south side of Ecola Creek. The expedition set their camp up on the north side of Ecola Creek. Assuming the mouth of the creek hasn't shifted too much, um, the whale would be near the Canada Beach Conference Center, which is why there's a cool little whale statue and their camp would be near Les Shirley Park. And most of the soldiers of the expedition and the Charbonneau family are in that camp this evening, except for one soldier, Hugh McNeil. And Steve's gonna help me out with this. sorted out. They believed that that really nice man was going to take Hugh into the second home and kill him for his blanket. This woman knew of the plot and just saved his life. Fortunately, Private McNeil didn't have to know what was going on until his life had been saved. One more story and then a couple of mentions here. So they buy 300 pounds of blubber, several gallons of oil. Next morning, they need to start their trip back. This stuff needs to be carried over to La Moquette. They don't have pack horses here. Um, William Clark has one of the great quotes out of the journals, small as this stock of oil and blubber is, I prize it highly and I thank Providence for directing the whale to us and think him much more kind to us than he was to Jonah. Having sent this monster to be swallowed by us instead of swallowing of us as Jonah's did. So they're starting their trip over to Lamoquid and 
the way Clark tells this next story, you get the feeling that Clark is in the lead of his group, which makes sense, he's the captain, and that Clark is not carrying his fair share of the 300 pounds of blubber and several gallons of oil because York is on this side trip. So of course, York is probably carrying William Clark's portion. And there's other people walking over to Lima Kid with loads of whale blubber and oil. And Clark is in the lead of their group. And they come up and they're following a group of probably Clatsop people. And the person at the back of this line of Clatsop people is a woman who is carrying a large bundle of whale blubber on her head. How many people have you, how many of you have ever walked over to Lima Kid? Is it really easy? No. no. And that's with a fairly modern trail with switchbacks. I don't think I would choose to do it in January, come to think of it. So she's walking along and slips, and her load falls off her head. And it's, you know, Tillamook Head isn't like a cliff, but it's steep. And the load is sort of on its way downhill and she has a, a strap that she's holding it to keep it from falling away from her. The next person ahead of her is her husband. He's carrying a large load. So by the time he realizes what has happened and gets turned around and gets his load set down, he's not the first person to get there to help. William Clark is. William Clark realizes that she's in distress, this load of blubbers, you know, headed downhill, and he's going to, you get the impression from the journals, he's going to save her, he's going to be the gentleman, he's going to go up there, pick the load up, pick her up, put it back on her head, send it on her way. He gets over there and he grabs the same line that she's holding. All he can do is help her keep it from falling. They get more people gathered around, her husband included, and together they pull it back up to the trail. She's back up on her feet. Together they lift the load up, send her on her way. William Clark is astounded with how much this woman is carrying, and apparently other people were too, carrying large loads. He writes in his journal that that load must have been 100 weight. For years, I thought that would translate to 100 pounds, until I found out it's an old British um, uh, measurement that would actually be 112 pounds. So the explorers survive their winter here, start their return trip, and um, one of the variances they do on the return route, if you're following the map, is they're going to uh, be in the Wallula Gap area, not too far from the Walla Walla area. And the Walla Wallas are the people there. And there is a Shoshone woman prisoner that the Shoshones were picked on by the other nations, and, and their young people were often captured at an age where they remembered their original language and, and became slaves among another culture. And so they encounter a Shoshone woman prisoner, and she helps to translate information about the Wallula Gap shortcut that the explorers are going to end up using from Chief uh, Yelept through Sacagawea. So she's going to help out. They end up taking that shortcut. The expedition splits into five different parties on the way home. Each captain, each sergeant has a group and a mission. And they're all going to get back together where the Yellowstone and Missouri flow together. And they do, which is one of the most remarkable things about this expedition. And now they're almost back to the Mandan and Hadatsa Indian villages. And they get back there and check in with those people that they spent that long cold winter with. One of Jefferson's goals was not only to have lots of plant and animal specimens and maps and journals brought back, but to have people come to meet him in Washington, D.C. He, he had to stay home and be president. He didn't get to go on the trip. So maybe people could come and meet. And, and Lewis has actually arranged for two delegations already, which we kind of by, bypassed. 
and now they're, they're going to try to make arrangements to, to have maybe some of the Mandan people join them for the last leg of the trip and go to Washington, D.C. And they do. One of the chiefs that they've become friends with during that winter, I'll probably mispronounce his name, um, Sheheki, and his wife, Yellowcorn, and their son now joined the expedition. Along with a French-Canadian man, René Jusson, and his wife, and their son and daughter. The Charbonneau family gets left off at this point, um, with Clark become good friends with the family, and, and he's writing the letter back to them as they're heading down the Missouri, saying he would love to see Jean-Baptiste be educated, and years later they're all going to meet up, and, and that's going to happen. But now we've dropped off the Charbonneau family, we have gained Sheheki and Yellowcorn, their son, and the Jusson family as the explorers travel um, down the Missouri River and into St. Louis on the last leg of the journey. So even though most of the movies and books and statues and such that we see about the expedition tell us about one person, one woman who became famous, I think we can agree that many women were a crucial part of this chapter of history. Thank you, Sally. There's a, a lot of things like that, and I think I mentioned last time that there's, if you, if you want to just kind of get an overview of everything, get a book by Gary Moulton that's kind of a day by day of the, the journey. And uh, you can see what happened every day. He kind of brings all of the journals together, not just Lewis and Clark, but the men who are on it. And you can find out you know, what they're going to do. I was actually going to bring the one for today, but I forgot. See what they're, they're on their way back by this time. Yeah, yeah, somewhere up there. Uh, so anyway, you learned a lot more about Lewis and Clark, and you know there was a lot more behind it, right? And if you want to learn more, a great place to go is up to Fort Platson. And uh, visit the visitor center there, go out to the fort. Sally's got lots of brochures. Uh, be sure, uh, she'll hang around here, you can come up and talk to her afterwards. want to mention that uh, next week, next, week uh, next month, um, whatever the date is, the last Thursday of May, our guest is going to be a local guy, Bob Moberg, Robert Moberg. He's going to talk about his early career in fishing. Uh, you may or may not know that, but uh, that's, uh, he grew up out uh, on the uh, Columbia doing fishing. And uh, we're gonna talk, to, I think, a little bit about horse singing, watch a video about it. And uh, it'll be interesting. It'll, that's uh, an amazing story about what some of the men went through. I'm sure there were women involved in that too. So, yeah. Maybe not on the boat, but they were certainly doing the cleaning and uh, sending the men out. Anyway, so that will be uh, the end of May. May 30th. And May 30th, thank you. Uh, make sure you put that on your calendar. And remember, there's a sign-up sheet back there if you want to get a personal reminder. And you'll actually get our uh, press release that we send out on every one of these. Uh, look around, uh, you know, take the museum information with you. Stop by as we continue to do things uh, to integrate ourselves into the community. If you have any great ideas, uh, see me or one of our board members. We hope you get involved with us. Thank you very much.